I am trusting that this series of messages is lifting you up and encouraging you at the same time as challenging you. Because when God calls you to do something that looks impossible, that looks beyond uh, the realm of possibility, God is working on your behalf because you cannot do it on your own, but you can do it with God's power and strength if you wait for Him and you trust Him with all your heart. Stay tuned. I think on the rare occasion that you find a story kind of takes a different twist. And today, as I conclude this series of messages where God told Abraham to start counting stars when he could actually see none, we're going to see here in this last message how unpredictable the events have taken their turn. Naturally speaking, from the human point of view, this is the hardest message in the whole of the series. Abraham, from the time we saw the very first message where God told him at the era of Chaldeans to go and to this point of his life, about 50 plus years or so. In reality, what Abraham is going through is what each of us will go through. It is a school of faith. Faith is like a muscle that it does not grow while you're just sitting there eating potato chips and watching television. Faith like muscle, it grows by exercise. And this exercise of the school of faith where Abraham entered in the era of Chaldeans, and now we see him going from kindergarten to PhD program in the school of faith. We saw him graduate from kindergarten when he was rescued from Egypt after lying to Pharaoh. Then he graduated from elementary school when he tithed his entire net worth to Melchizedek. And then we saw him graduate from high school when he realized that Ishmael is not the one after he called out to God and said, let Ishmael be the one, and God said no. Then he graduated from the college of faith when he trusted the Lord to give him and Sarah at their very old age a son, and they named him Laughter. And here today, you're going to see him going through his Ph.D. program in faith. The reason I call it a Ph.D. program, because the highest degree you could ever earn in a Ph.D. program, you do five examinations. That's after three or four years of, of coursework. You do five examinations. They're five hours each. They're called comprehensives. And trust me, they're called comprehensives for a reason. And then you write a dissertation that has to be original work. It's not something you regurgitate from secondary sources. It is very rigorous. It is tough simply because it is it. And that's what Abraham is completing today, his Ph.D. program. I want you to turn with me, if you haven't already, to Genesis 22. Look at verse 2 with me. Because in Genesis 22, Abraham goes through what none of us, none of us can ever understand or comprehend, uh, not on this side of heaven. Uh, this time... God's voice that Abraham was used to hearing. Now, this time, God's voice shatters his peace and his peaceful existence. God's command comes as a sharp knife piercing into his very heart. This time, God's voice and God's request uh, can only be described as devastating. This call presents Abraham with one of the greatest tests, if not the greatest test, that God could ever put his friend through. Verse 2, Abraham, here I am. Take your son Isaac. You notice he mentioned him by name because Abraham could have said, you know, Eliezer is adopted. 
What about Ishmael? He said, no, 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 it's Isaac by name. In order to emphasize the point, he said, whom you love, his total affection is now placed on Isaac. And go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. To say that these words appear as an extremely cruel words would be an understatement. But Lord, wait a minute. Do you know what you're saying? This is the son of promise. Lord, I can offer you a thousand head of rams. Lord, I have a thousand head of cattle. I can offer them as a sacrifice. Lord, I can offer you Eliezer, my adopted one. Lord, I can even offer you Ishmael. But not Isaac. Please, Lord, not Isaac. Lord, take me. I lived long enough. I will go on the altar. I'll offer myself as a sacrifice instead of Isaac. Lord, remember the miraculous work that you have done. All of that is going to go down the drain. Lord, you promise that you keep your word, and you kept your word with me for over 25 years. Lord, your reputation is going to be marred in this land. Lord, my testimony is going to be tarnished. You know, the amazing thing is, Abraham never said any of this. <laughs> Probably that's what I would have done. Not Abraham. He didn't say any of this. Has any of God's gifts or God's blessings in your life taken God's place? And only answer that to yourself. But don't miss the main issue here. It is not so much that Abraham placed all of his love on Isaac, important as that may be. And the Bible makes it clear that this was a test. What is important is that God's blessings of the future salvation is going to come through Isaac. Don't miss this. This is a big picture here. For the first time, Abraham is now confronted with a conflict. I mean, this is huge conflict. It's a conflict between the promises of God and the command of God. How is he going to resolve this conflict in his mind? How is he going to resolve this conflict in his life? He will have to resolve it in one of two ways. Is God a liar? Is God an erratic God? Does God not know his own mind? But that's not the God that he grew to know. This is not the God he grew to love. This is not the gracious God that he encountered again and again and again. This is not El Shaddai, whom he knew that he will always keep his word and never go back on his promises. This is not the, an untrustworthy God. This is a trustworthy God in whom he trusted. And so Abraham trusts God even in the appearance of the impossibility and the most crucial difficulty of his life. What's going on in Abraham's mind, do you think? Well, the thing is, Genesis 22 doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us what's going on in his mind. There's some clues there, but it doesn't tell us. Beloved, listen to me very carefully. The Bible reveals to us 2,000 years later what was going on in Abraham's mind. It's in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though he had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be redeemed. 
Abraham reasoned. Here's that. Underline it in your Bible. So you have your own Bible. Reason. That's really what's going on in his mind at that time. The Holy Spirit reveals this to us, albeit 2,000 years later. Uh, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and practically speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Now, of course, we know in hindsight and many years later that this was a mere test. But, of course, he, he did not know that. And because he passed this test, God allowed Abraham to see something that nobody else before or, or even since, to be truthful, they allow him to see how God himself is going to do what he spared Abraham from doing, and that is offer his one and only son as a sacrifice to die for us. When Isaac asked the question, Father, where is the lamb? Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? That was a question that will be answered only by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That is the purpose of all Old Testament animal sacrifices. They were pointing to the coming Lamb of God, the unblemished Lamb of God, the sinless Lamb of God, when he is slain on that cross. And Abraham's answer to Isaac was a prophetic word. It was a word of prophecy about the coming of Jesus 2,000 years from that time. He said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. But Isaac's question, where is the lamb, was repeated by so many writers in the Old Testament. It was repeated in the Old Testament again and again. Isaiah 53 asked, where is the lamb? And the answer is the man of sorrow who will be like a lamb led to the slaughter. For it is this lamb of God, Jesus, that Abraham looked forward to. It is this lamb of God, Jesus, whom every faithful believer in the Old Testament looked forward to. It is this Lamb of God, Jesus, who is our shepherd. It is this Lamb of God, Jesus, who alone can wash away our sin and our guilt and our shame by his holy and righteous blood on the cross. It is this Lamb of God, Jesus, who shall come again, and it may be sooner than we think, to judge both the living and the dead. And when Abraham named the place, Yahweh Yara, and it's amazing the word Yara is the same word actually in Arabic, Hebrew, and Aramaic, which means sea. That's what it means. Somebody Yara means sea. Jehovah, Jehovah Jara, we say it. But that's kind of from the Latin. But God will see to it. That's really a literal translation. When you say Jehovah Jara, I say God is going to see to it. God is going to see to it. Can you say that with me? God is going to see to it. That's literally what he was saying. God himself will see to it that he provides a Savior. God himself will provide a way out of this dilemma between his mercy and his justice. God himself will provide a solution to man's predicament. Whatever you might be going through right now, and some of you going through tough times, whatever you might be facing today, you need to remember that God will provide a way out of your dilemma, that God will see to it, that he will give you a way of escape, that God will provide a balm to your wounds, that God will compensate you for all the years that has been eaten by the locusts. God will give you his joy again. God will dry up your tears. God will see to it that you are vindicated. Amen belongs here. How can you describe the love of God? It's an impossibility. But there's something else about this indomitable faith of Abraham I don't want you to miss. I don't want you to miss it. It's in verse 5. If you read the passage many times and you missed it, go back, underline it, especially one word. I want to point you to it. One word in that verse. Here's what Abraham said to the servants. They came a long way. Beersheba is down in Gaza. Gaza is south. And they took a three-day journey to get to Jerusalem. And so when they come to the bottom of the Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, 
uh, where you look up and you see the Church of Holy Sepulchre, which is one of the highest spots in Jerusalem. He comes to the bottom of the mountain, and he says to the servants, he said, stay here with the donkey, and the boy and I will go up to the mountain to worship, and we, can you say that with me? We. will come back. <laughs> he didn't say, I'm going to go there and offer Isaac and come back. He said, no, 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 no. We're going to go up, and we're both going to come back. <laughs> it's such confidence that God will raise Isaac from the dead no matter what happens. He had no doubt in his mind. Now he's graduated from his Ph.D. program. Don't miss Isaac. Most historians place the age of Isaac at this point because we don't know. It's said after these things, so we don't really know, but it's kind of calculated guess. He was between the ages of 15 and 30. So he was a strong man, young, strong man. He could have run away. <laughs> I mean, his father's 100 plus years old. He could have overpowered him. He could have said, you want me to do what? Uh, he could have said, nice knowing you, father. <laughs> Goodbye. I enjoyed the three-day journey with you, pop, <laughs> but this is where I leave you. Uh, I have plans for my life. Lying on that altar is not one of them. Beloved, listen to me. How many times do we claim that we love the Lord, but only if it doesn't cost us anything? And we love the Lord if the price is right. We love the Lord, but only if we don't have to surrender anything. We love the Lord, but only if we keep all of the blessings to us and our family. We love the Lord, but only if we don't have to give up misplaced affections. Oh, I love the Lord. I don't want to give the idols in my life up. Oh, I love the Lord, but only if I don't have to give up my wrong relationships. I love the Lord, but I don't want to give up these wrong habits, these sinful habits. No doubt Isaac grew up hearing from his parents, possibly again and again and again and again, how he is a gift of God, how he is... His birth is supernatural and miraculous. How the promise of God for the salvation of Israel will come through his descendants. Uh, how God's promise uh, that he is the miracle child, that God has great plans for his life. Uh, how faithful God has been to his mom and dad. How Abraham's faith in God and trust in God becomes so unshakable and reaching this point of being unwavering. Now with this brief introduction, I get to my sermon. <laughs> I kid you not, I have six points. <laughs> First, Abraham's obedience of faith is characterized by promptness. Can you say it here? Can you say it with me? Promptness. Abraham, here I am, Lord. Not once, not twice. Abraham, circumcise the men in your household. He immediately did. Abraham, let Hagar and Ishmael go. Tore his heart. Yes, Lord. Then comes the biggest test of obedience of all, of all time. Abraham, take Isaac whom you love. You love dearly. Offer him to me. Here I am. Prompt obedience. Secondly, Abraham's obedience of faith is characterized by sustainability. It was prompt, but also was sustained. His obedience was carried through a long period of time. To be sure, he went through stages. But nonetheless, it was sustained a long period of time. It began when God appeared to him from nowhere at the Ur of Chaldeans, which in modern-day Iraq, and told him to leave what is dear and what is near and leave everything behind and go to a land that he does not know where, that God is going to show him. All the way, 50-plus years later, with this greatest test, give me your dearest and your nearest. His obedience first was what? Prompt. Secondly, sustained. Thirdly, it was a willing obedience. 
It was willing. Now, many of us say, Lord, I'm willing to obey you. Surely, Lord, you know I'm willing to obey you. <laughs> but then our willingness gets tested. And most of us at this point, we say, Lord, am I really hearing you right? I'm not sure if this is your voice. Really, Lord, I don't think you want me to do this. Do you really, Lord, do you? And, and we kind of drag it out. I'm going to wait until I'm really sure it is the voice of God. <laughs> now, beloved, willing obedience is seen so clearly in the Garden of Gethsemane. <laughs> Father, if possible, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours. And Hebrews 10, 7 tells us about Jesus' willing obedience in this way. Here's what Jesus said. Here I am. It is written about me in the scrolls. I have come to do your will, O God. It was prompt obedience. It was sustained obedience. It was willing obedience. And fourthly, it was settled obedience. What do I mean by that? Now, many of us are willing to obey, but then we get pushed and shoved with the forces of this world. We get pushed and shoved with people. We get pushed and shoved by circumstances, and we get pushed and shoved with all kinds of factors in life. Um, to help us either not obey or do what I fall for sometimes, what I call partial obedience. Settled obedience is what is said of Daniel. Daniel purposed in his heart. <laughs> there is no equivocation. There is no wavering. He purposed in his heart. That is settled obedience. Settled obedience said of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke that he set his face toward Jerusalem like a flint. This is the opposite of convenient obedience. This is the opposite of mercurial obedience. It was prompt. It was sustained. It was willing. It was settled. And fifthly, it was contagious obedience. You say, how come? Well, think about this. Think of the millions of believers in the Christian history who have read the story of Abraham <laughs> and Abraham's obedience, and they cried out to God, Lord, <laughs> that's how I want my life to be. Lord, that's how I want my relationship with you to be. It is contagious. And finally, it is a rewarded obedience. Obedience always will be rewarded, <laughs> and it's not always immediate but it will be rewarded. If you look at verses 15 all the way to 19 and even a little bit further, you see how Abraham abundantly rewarded. Not only past promises, counting the stars and the number of the stars is reiterated, reaffirmed, but he gave him a little extra. <laughs> he said, your descendants will be like the sand of the seashore. <laughs> the Bible makes it very clear that God is faithful. But also, he's going to reward faithfulness. <laughs> Listen, I built my whole life on the principle that the Bible said, God is no man's debtor. He is not going to be holding to you. He's not going to owe you anything. He's not going to be indebted to you. God will give back not just what you give him, but he's going to give it back heaped over, shaken, overabundance of it. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, but I know there are people in this room. There are people in this sanctuary. I know who would stand here and testify to the truth of what I'm telling you. Jesus was rewarded for his obedience, not only that on the third day he rose with every ounce of his omnipotence, but also he is now reigning and ruling on the right hand of the Father in heaven. The world may be falling apart, but he is not. He is now in total control in heaven. He rules over the hearts of his children. But the day is coming, and it's a lot sooner that we may think that every knee shall bow and that every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You and I 
and not only blessed for our obedience here and now, but one day we're going to hear from the lips of Jesus. Well done. Well done. Well done. Say it with me. Well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in the joy of your Father. Don't ever lose sight of this. Don't ever lose sight of this. Every time you lose sight of this, you get in the dumps. Every time you lose sight of this, you get into trouble. Don't lose sight of it. Don't lose sight of it.